Think of vapor pressure as a liquid's ability to first evaporate and then boil. It is a liquid's ability to push upwards and overcome the effects of air pressure which is holding it down. It is also temperature dependent, so that means warmer liquids are able to evaporate and eventually boil faster than colder liquids. Vapor pressure becomes really easy to understand if you think of it in terms of what is pushing down and what's pushing upwards. So vapor pressure is the upwards pushing force that allows a liquid to evaporate or to boil. And then here I'm drawing a downwards arrow and this represents the atmospheric pressure which at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch. So this is what keeps water a liquid at room temperature because there's weight pressing down on the water so it's unable to become steam. However, the water is constantly evaporating, so I'm going to draw a small upwards arrow, and this represents the vapor pressure of water at room temperature, or at a cooler temperature. So, on the right-hand side, when you heat up the water, it starts to boil because the vapor pressure starts to grow. So the vapor pressure increases, I'm going to draw a big red arrow, and it is now the same thing as the downwards pushing force of atmospheric pressure, so when vapor pressure and atmospheric pressure are equal to each other, the liquid starts to boil. And that's what vapor pressure is. Vapor pressure is simply is the upwards pushing force of your liquid. Vapor pressure can be understood by reading this graph. So we have three different liquids here, ether, which is some sort of flammable liquid, ethanol, and then water. So the thing to keep in mind is if you have a high vapor pressure like alcohol and gasoline, you're going to boil at a much lower temperature and you evaporate a lot more quickly. So here's ether. Ether will boil at 34.6 degrees Celsius. So almost like human body temperature, it just becomes a gas. So it's highly volatile. It becomes a gas easily. So remember, vapor pressure is the upwards pushing force. And if it's equal to atmospheric pressure, which is the downwards pushing force, then the liquid will boil. So in ethanol's case, it's going to boil at 78 degrees, where the vapor pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. And then when you read water's graph, let's follow the blue line here, you can see that vapor pressure is temperature dependent. So what does that mean? That means as it heats up, it becomes easier to evaporate. It evaporates much more quickly. Eventually, it reaches a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. So at 100 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure is 760, so it's pushing upwards at 760 millimeters of mercury. And at sea level, remember the atmospheric pressure is pushing downwards at 760, so when they're both equal to each other, then the liquid starts to boil. Reading a phase diagram of water can answer hypothetical questions like, what would the boiling point of water be in the mountains? Or would you have to cook longer in the mountains? So on and so forth. So there's three curves that you want to look out for. So this first one that I've drawn in red, this represents something known as a sublimation or deposition line. Okay, so subliming just means the solid form becomes a gaseous state. It just skips over the liquid state. So ice becoming steam would be sublimation and this requires the absorption of energy. And there is also deposition, which is steam becoming ice. So it's the reverse process. Okay, so of course you have your three phases of water. You have solid, liquid, and gas. Okay, and that first curve separates the boundary between steam and gas. It's that red curve that you see there. The next curve is this blue one that I'm drawing in. And this represents the boundary between ice and water. So this is the solid and the liquid form. And this line represents the melting line or the freezing line. Okay, so water melts and it freezes at zero degrees Celsius at sea level. Melting is the absorption of energy and then freezing requires energy to be released. And finally, this green line represents the boiling and the condensation line. So it separates the, the phases of liquid and gas. So when water boils, it becomes steam. And when steam condenses, it becomes liquid again. And this both happens at 100 degrees Celsius at sea level air pressure.
So those are our six phase changes and they're divided into three curves or three lines. And it all makes sense once you think about it. Okay, what absorbs energy and then what releases energy. So now we can look at this and be like, all right, one atmosphere of air pressure is sea level. And this is how you read a phase diagram. You literally draw a line across and then you think about altitudes. So here's a mountain that I'm drawing. Okay, here's a stick figure, that's me standing at sea level. So at sea level, we have one atmosphere of pressure. If I climb the mountain, if I go higher up in elevation, there's actually thinner air above me. So there's less air pressure. So it's kind of hard for students to think about, but if I am climbing the mountains, I'm actually below one atmosphere of air pressure. Okay, so higher elevation means I go below one. It seems a little backwards, but it makes sense when, once you think about it. And then if I'm above one atmosphere of air pressure, that means I've gone below sea level. So now I'm in like a gulch or a valley or something, or death valley where the air pressure is a lot higher. That column of air that's above my head is now a lot more, so the air is heavier. There's more air pressure. Okay, so now we're going to draw a line going across. So at sea level, we're going to see that the water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so it's going to hit the boiling curve. And then when you look straight down, you're going to see that the temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. So far, so good. That seems to make sense. Okay, so sea level, when I boil my water, it's going to take... 100 degrees Celsius before we start to see bubbles start to form. However, if I go up the mountains, let's say I live in a cabin like in Big Bear or something, or to the extreme, like we try to boil water in uh, at the top of Mount Everest, okay, that means there's less air pressure. Okay, so less air pressure, pick any point below one atmosphere, draw a line across, it's going to stop on the boiling curve right there. And then we draw a line straight down. And then we're going to estimate our temperatures. So in the mountains, the boiling point actually decreases. It's actually less than 100, a lot less than 100. You know, in really at really high elevations, it's going to boil at like 70 degrees Celsius. Okay, if you go beyond that, it's going to boil at like 50 degrees Celsius. Okay, we're just going to estimate. The point is, if you go higher up in elevation, the boiling point decreases because the, the vapor pressure is able to overcome the atmospheric pressure and it has an easier time boiling. But now, let's pick a point above one and let's go across and then straight down. So this is like me at Death Valley attempting to boil water. The water has to work a lot harder. So that means the temperature has to be a lot higher so then the water is able to overcome the the large mass of air that's now above the the water so in order for the water to boil it has to be at a higher temperature because there's a lot more air now holding it down so at sea level water boils at 100 degrees celsius but if you attempt to boil water in the mountains it's going to boil at a lower temperature because the air is thinner so the water has an easier time jumping up and outwards because the vapor pressure can now match the atmospheric pressure you guys saw this in the bell jar if i remove the air pressure around the water the water just jumps out on its own and it starts to boil at room temperature but what's strange is if you attempt to cook or hard boil an egg in the mountains you actually have to cook for longer because the even though the water seemingly appears to boil it's boiling at a much lower temperature so that means you have to adjust for that and then cook for longer because the water is only boiling at like 90 degrees celsius or something in big bear and the same goes for when you're baking cookies so at high altitudes you have to cook for a minute or two longer because even though the water seemingly appears to boil it's doing so at a lower temperature so as a result you have to cook for a longer duration of time we're going to read the phase diagram of carbon dioxide, otherwise known as dry ice, which is ideal for camping because it keeps food cold without the wetness and the spills, simply because there's no liquid phase at sea level pressures, and we're going to understand why with this graph. So I'm drawing in this red curve, and that curve represents the sublimation line because it separates solid from gas.
So subliming just means it goes from the solid to the gaseous phase and it skips over the liquid phase entirely. And that's what sublimation is. We learn this with the water phase diagram and sublimation requires energy to be absorbed. And obviously we're going to fill in these other lines here, but it's not too important to understanding what carbon dioxide is, but this would be the melting freezing line because it's the boundary that separates solid and liquid. So we'll go ahead and just write that in there. Melting is going from solid to liquid. Freezing is going from liquid to solid. And they share the same curve because it happens at the same temperature. This right here, this green line, this green curve, represents the boiling and the condensation curve. So technically dry ice can boil and it can condense un under the right atmospheric conditions or the right pressure conditions. But the one that we're mainly concerned about is the sublimation curve because it allows you to really understand dry ice and why it sublimes. Because if you really examine this curve here, and let me go ahead and erase this, if you look at the curve, the only thing that's possible for dry ice at sea level, which is one atmosphere of pressure, is the sublimation curve. So if you draw the line across and then you go down, it actually just hits the, the sublimation line and it goes to negative 78.5 degrees Celsius. So this curve, again, separates solid and gas. That's the best that you could do for carbon dioxide. So there's no way for dry ice to have a liquid phase because in order for that to happen, it needs to have a minimum pressure of 5.11 atmospheres. So that's, that's not possible anywhere on Earth unless you go to the deep trenches of the ocean. But that, again, is that's not feasible. Why would anyone do that? Like bring dry ice to you know the deep trenches just to see it have a liquid phase. So at sea level on dry land, you're at one atmosphere of pressure and it's going to have a temperature of negative 78.5 degrees Celsius. So it's extremely cold. It's like way colder than normal ice and it will sublime. So eventually the chunk of CO2 that you buy at the supermarket, the dry ice, will eventually disappear because it just becomes gaseous. We're going to see liquid CO2 get created in this demonstration here. So there is carbon dioxide or dry ice that's in the pipette and it's being clamped with a pair of pliers so that the pressure builds up. So as the pressure mounts, remember the minimum pressure that's required for liquid CO2 is 5.11 atmospheres. So you can see how it's starting to bulge and the dry ice becomes translucent as it becomes a liquid. So you can see the liquid CO2 appear just for a brief moment, then the pipette will burst because there's a lot of pressure inside. Air pressure has a great effect on the states of matter and phase changes. I hope you learned a lot by looking at the demonstrations in the bell jar and learning how to read a phase diagram as well as understanding vapor pressure. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time on Wind Chemistry.